Welcome back to Brew on Tap from Mahoney and Sons at Canada Place. He's Ben Dextray's documentary filmmaker. Good to see you, sir. Uh, we've seen your work before on the show, and I'm sure we'll probably show a little of your work as we talk. But more importantly than, than what you're doing with the, the film series, I, or the documentary, I want to talk about craft beer, because you and I have had occasion to tip a few and, yeah. and talk about the origins of craft beer. I'm going to ask you a very loaded question. I want, I want your complete candid answer. Sure. What is craft beer and what is not craft beer, and how does one differentiate between the two? Oh, well, I, I, was, you know, I was talking to some of your guests, actually, just over there in the holding area. I mean, that's something that's sort of a fluid, it's, it's got a fluid answer to that question in the sense that it depends. I mean, it depends on the person. I mean, for me, I'd say that craft beer is locally defined. So someone that is brewing specifically for their, the people in their neighborhood, their community. I mean, that's where this originated, right? Is that sort of aesthetic, that, that principle. And now we're seeing craft brewing blow up to the extent where you're seeing, you know, brewers that have reached national level, even though they're still brewing within those communities. And you got to wonder, some people that, you know, rebel in that sort of principle question that. They go, hey, well, is that local brewery still relevant to that sort of that, that mindset? Or now that they're, you know, I could buy the same beer in Nova Scotia, does, does that have the same thing? Is, is it still attached to that? This is where I love the debate because my ideology is that craft beer is about the product, what's in the glass. Yeah. It's not about the scale of the, of the brewery or the distribution point or how far it goes. But yet some people believe that once you achieve a certain level of production, you're no longer craft. Am I wrong on that, Ben? Well, let's, let's put it in this respect. I mean, modern day craft brewers, I mean, even though you want to you know, say that craft beer is you know, hand paddled and, and brewed with your hands, I mean, how many brewers do we know in the craft industry actually do that? I mean, is it a marketing tool that we're actually using to sell our beer to a consumer that believes in those principles? Or like, you know, if you're talking about having the same beer that you could have on the other side of the country, the very means that you're using to produce, the methodology that you're using to produce that beer, to get it to the other side of the country and still have the same kind of taste, the same carbonation as it would taste if you were getting it right off those taps. I mean, how does that bespeak what level is going in, what funding, what money is going into that brewery? Okay, but at the same time, for example, like you and I uh, met recently, we're talking about Lagunitas yeah. uh, out, of, uh, out of Northern California, okay? Recently got purchased by Heineken, mm -hmm. which is about as big as you could possibly get, yeah, exactly. okay? So assuming that the quality of the beer stays the same, and the brewmaster and the recipes stay the same, just because they're owned by a massive conglomerate, does that now disqualify them as being craft beer? Well, well let me ask you this. If you, if you sat down and you were sold, a uh, it's not even a Heineken, but a Corona, it's kind of the same level yeah. in size and, and, and scope, but if they tried to sell you a Corona in a frozen, timid landscape like Canada, would you buy it? I mean, it has everything to do with marketing. Right? And when you have more money to factor into producing that beer, people are going to buy that beer based on what they see of it. Now, if you're producing a beer for your local community, sure, people are going to buy that because, hey, I know Joe. You know, he's got just here for the beer. That's some good stuff. But if you buy that same beer in Moscow, is it going to, is it going to taste? Is it going to be the same beer? And that's sort of the question that underlays everything about beer, not necessarily the hectoliters you're producing but ultimately the, the, the love and care that's going into producing that, that, well, that beer. I'll tell you what, I could have a day-long conversation with you because we virtually did have that not, not long ago, but yeah. finally, let's talk again about the documentary that you put together, sure. the, the, the kind of the history of craft beer in BC. Where are you at with that? Uh, it's coming along very nicely, but I mean, this is sort of the, the essence of it, and that is bogging it down in, in the sense of the ethical debate that surrounds beer and how, as it's developing. I mean, in BC, what we've just seen in recent development is a switch of government, and it's a hung government. Now, my ultimate question is, what, the, what is that going to mean for the brewing industry here? Because I even heard you before say, in past tense, brewing in BC has blown up. So are we past that point? What does that mean with a new government coming into play, and what does that ultimately mean for my documentary as it curtails the, the story of beer in, in BC from a craft brewing perspective? Hmm, I see a cliffhanger episode. Ben Dextray's pleasure, sir. Thank you. More Brew on Tap from Mahoney and Sons in Canada Place coming up.
So over three years in and continuing to kill it, and one of the breweries that you always hear good things about is, is Four Winds. So take us back to the origins. What, what did the concept start? Why get into beer? Why get into beer? Um, why not get into beer, really? No, uh, it started because um, my, my dad and my brother, uh, Brent, um, they were passionate about home brewing and they were home brewing together for a number of years before we got into this, of course. Um, but it kind of started uh, um, out, out, of, uh, out of the idea that we just wanted to do something independent and something different and something we could be passionate about. And, uh, and uh, what, what happened was we, we, myself, my two brothers and our, our father, we're, we were all kind of doing our separate things and, and uh, my dad had retired from his uh, previous position and, and, and uh, he was working on wooden boats, so he was building boats. Myself and my two brothers, we kind of quit the jobs we were doing and we started just helping him build boats and so all four of us were in the boat shop and we were kind of working away on these boats and it, it just so happened that my dad was brewing beer in the boat shop and then Brent started brewing beer and they kind of that kind of became the priority after a while. And that probably coincided with the time that the brewing industry was really blowing up. It was starting to but that was a little bit before the sort of big boom that just happened. Um, talking sort of maybe 2009, uh, 2010 and so they, they, you know, we were we were working on these boats. Uh, they were brewing home home brews, and then Brent basically realized that he r really had a passion for it, wanted to see if there was a position for him in the industry, and kind of went and checked out all the breweries uh, at the time. There was only four or five breweries in Vancouver at the time. Uh, he finally got a job with R&D Brewing, got on as a keg washer, quickly became the, the head brewer there, learned the kind of industry there, and then uh, and my dad was able to gather some funds and, and, and get that together, and then we kind of joined forces and opened up 2013. So it's a family business, but Garrett, you go back with the history of the family. Now, what, did you have a background in beer or just an interest in beer? You look like you might have been a server at some point or something. I had an interest in beer. Uh, like you said, I knew the family for a long time and it actually worked w with them in previous businesses uh, for a very long time. And uh, yeah, for a while I was working in the in the service industry and when these guys told me they were about to start a brewery, I always said, as soon as you need somebody, let me know. So uh, here I am. So did you foresee the industry in 2016 going into 2017 being where it is now? It's happened a lot quicker than I expected, uh, for sure, yeah. I mean, when, when we opened up, there was, uh, like I said, four or five breweries that were had been doing it a long time in Vancouver, and there weren't that many popping up. Uh, uh, Parallel 49 opened up a year before us, um, and then there was a, f a few other startups happening, but then, then we opened up. Uh, and, and, you know, we thought that, that, you know, maybe four or five, maybe ten breweries would open up per year, but it's... It's been crazy how many have been opening up, so it's amazing though. You're the guy working the streets in terms of trying to get your beer available uh, at various locations. Um, it's probably good for the consumer to have a variety of choices, but from your perspective, I mean, obviously you guys make good beers, there's no question about that, but it's hard, it's got to be harder getting tap space, especially for new, pe new, new people coming along. Yeah, I mean, there's so many bars and restaurants that are that are interested in supporting craft breweries. So, you know, we're, I think a few years ago, the average bar maybe would have one or two taps, uh, you know, kind of reserved for craft beer. Now, now almost all the taps seem to be going for craft beer. So I think if the if breweries really focus on the quality of beer, um, customers are going to want to drink it and restaurants are going to want to pour it. Now, I know you guys have some hardware, actually some plaques behind me. I mean, Beer of the Year was one of the most prestigious awards you could possibly win so does that just inspire you to want to continue to kill it and make bigger and better beers oh, totally yeah yeah I mean it gives you the confidence to keep pushing and trying to keep innovating and pushing the boundaries it definitely inspires us to, to, to work harder and and to create better and better beer um, I know that in the brewing industry Garrett there's a real camaraderie there's a real kinship that's unlike any other business where people that are competing with each other get along really well is it the same from the sales side as well? Like, are all salespeople getting along really well? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, uh, I actually play on a softball team every summer that's made up of different sales reps from different breweries around town. Uh, we see each other out on the road every single day, say hello. We're often doing events together. Uh, and it's really nice, you know, we all get along, uh, we share advice, and, um, and we kind of look after each other in a way. So it's a, it's a good industry to be a part of. Where, if you could predict, I mean, what, given what we've seen happen up to this point, where, where do we go, where are the next 12 months, 24 months going to take us beer-wise? What, what do you think? We're going to see more breweries open up. There's, there's, there's a lot that are slated to open up. And I think that there's still plenty of market share for us to gain in the craft brewing industry. Um, so, you know, as we convert the 
mass sort of beer drinkers over one person at a time. I think that there's plenty of market share to acquire and, and room for more people. I just think that it's going to basically uh, make, sh it's going to ensure that breweries really work on the quality and the innovation and make sure that their beers are up to par and that's going to encourage us all to do better and better. The listed percentage of craft beer drinkers across Canada is like 20% or something, which sounds ridiculously low, but I think that's skewed because maybe the other provinces don't have anywhere near the same industry we have. I think in BC, the craft beer consumer has got to be above 20%. Would you not agree? Yeah, I think so. It seems to be, especially in the condensed lower mainland. Um, but yeah, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think you're right. How much did your job improve after the Canadian, after the Beer of the Year award? Yeah, I mean, it definitely helped. I think uh, we right away had kind of created a good reputation for ourselves here in the lower mainland. Um, and this just kind of brought some recognition across the country, you know. Uh, we are somewhat limited in capacity, so supplying uh, all the way from here to Newfoundland isn't uh, possible at the moment, but it's nice to know that uh, people in other parts of the country have noticed us as well. Last question goes to you, Adam. What, what does 2017 hold for four wins? Can you give us a little peek of hint of something maybe to, to, to prepare for? Um, I think we're going to keep working on our barrel program, so the wood age stuff, you're going to see more and more of that. Uh, we've, in the last six to eight months, we've uh, installed fooders, so we have eight, eight 4,000 liter fooders from France um, that are uh, that are now in the works, and so we're going to be working on the wood aged and uh, just experimenting and keep pushing the boundaries. Well done. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Thank Thanks, you. Joe. Host hair services for Joe Leary and BC Brew on Tap provided by Bailey Murphy of Avant Garde Hair Studio in Yaletown at 1075 Mainland Street. For a list of services, call 604-688-1986 or online avantgardehair.com. Location services for BC Brew on Tap provided by Mahoney and Sons at Canada Place. For a list of locations, visit mahoneyandsons.com. Welcome back to BC Brew on Tap. My old buddy Chris Bierzgard, now the marketing director from Vancouver Island Brewing. How are you, sir? Good to see you. Not too bad, not too bad. Busy, busy these days. Uh, well, I was going to say, okay, you're a very busy guy, an important guy to talk to because you and I go back some years, and, and you've obviously been in the industry in, in a couple of different capacities. So you recently transplanted yourself to Vancouver Island Brewing, which decided to do a full-on relaunch, rebrand. When that offer first came to you, what, what are you thinking? It's like, is that like oh my God, or is it like, I, oh my God, I got to do this? It, it definitely was a, a bit of a daunting task when you first kind of have a look at it, but then you go and you look and, you know, there's great history there, great opportunity there, and if, you know, the, the person asking to bring me on was uh, someone I had worked for before, Tim Barnes, who was uh, the VP at Central City Brewing, uh, who took over the job as the president there, and I was like, Man, he's he's really saying all the right things and looking to build a dream team and you know kind of bring uh, this once great brand back to the prominence that it deserves to be at. So, talk about the fact that Vancouver Island Brewing has been around a long time, okay? And it's it's a, obviously a pretty well established brand. So when you're tasked with the challenge of having to like not just put like a fresh coat of paint on stuff. I mean you. Literally, you know, you, you change the, the, the market, you change the imaging, you change the, the, the logo. Like, that's a full-on brand resell. Uh, where do you begin with something like that? Research, first and foremost. You can't just make changes because you think they're the right idea or, you know, even when you have a bunch of experience in the industry and you have some ideas, you have to make sure you're, you know, reaching out to your customers, your consumers, everybody involved who uh, both already loves the brand as it stands. Um, and those who aren't drinking it and find out why, why do people love it? Why are people not buying it? Like what, what's the common ground? And um, it was an interesting process. We found in the process of it, although a lot of people did you know, feel nostalgic towards the brand, the general feeling was apathy. There wasn't a strong feeling one way or another, which in marketing terms can be very problematic. Is there such a thing as local love? I mean, obviously Vancouver Island has got a pretty good craft beer scene of its own and I would say I would hazard a guess and say Victoria's beer scene is damn good as is Vancouver's but considering the size Vancouver or Victoria's is, is particularly good 
So is there not just a lot of local loyalty or does today's beer drinker not care about that? There's absolutely local loyalty, but a lot of the loyalty that we were having was with consumers who are aging with us and probably drinking a bit less beer than they used to be. And uh, we weren't resonating with the youth. We weren't catching new consumers as they were graduating into craft beer. And I think, uh, you know, you can sit there and analyze as to why and what was done wrong. But instead of sitting there and blaming the past, let's look forward to the future. And, you know, what are what are the new beer consumers wanting? What are they wanting? How do we deliver it to them in, in a package that's very interesting to them so they'll pick it up and try it? So let me ask you a loaded question. In your capacity as a marketing director, unlike, say, if you've got a brand new flavor of, of chewing gum, you can't just stand outside an arena as people are walking out and hand them a package you can't just give them a beer like so when you're rebranding something other than doing specific say launch parties at, at a bar here or there how do you turn Joe and Joanne average consumer onto the fact that you've you've rebranded well for us it's a I guess you could call it threefold one you do have some sampling opportunities but they have to be in select sampling. select you know select sampling in government liquor stores private liquor stores it has to be on a premise that you can allow sampling at so obviously we're doing a lot of that getting liquid to lips is uh, you know what's often called and then a really big thing with us was the packaging making you so sure we stood out on store shelves because in the craft beer industry there's a lot going on and there's a lot of amazing brands out there doing a lot of amazing cool stuff and you know, dragons with lasers shooting out of their eyes and everything under the sun. That's, I really like that stuff. But we couldn't just follow the leader and try and do that and stand out. So we made a very strong effort in our research process. We, we noticed that, you know, there wasn't a lot of really clean, simple brands out there. And those that were, were almost going a little bit too far right. down that road. We needed, we used really what is classic consumer packaged goods you know, design fundamentals, but uh, we call it the 30 foot and six inch. So 30 feet away, you're gonna see bright, beautiful can, but six inches from the face, there's still that level of detail that I think craft beer lovers like. Okay, so obviously very colorful and, and, and uh, a bit again, very simple type of branding. Um, what did you throw out and what, what is new to the VI family? Well, we did our best not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So there are a few products that um, we reformulated and uh, gave a brand refresh. So Piper's Pale Ale is still Piper's Pale Ale, although the recipe design had got dialed in a lot and kind of returned back to the former glory that brought Piper's Pale Ale up to what, you know, at one time was one of the biggest craft beers in the province. Uh, large in part, we made sure it was a good quality English Pale Ale. Um, Herman's Dark Lager got turned into Dominion Dark Lager because a lot of the marketing, as people will see it out and about, is, is very location-based to Vancouver Island. So the Dominion Observatory is a, is a call out to that. And uh, Sea Dog Amber Ale turned into Carmana Ale and became a much more woodsy, uh, deep amber ale versus a kind of a, a lighter, you know, not terribly different from Piper's Amber Ale. And so far, quickly, How's it been? Huge success so far. Yeah. People are, it's really resonating with people. And that's not to say there weren't challenges. You know, we, you can't just go change everything and have everybody in love with it. So we've had to spend a lot of time, you know, talking to our, our loyal consumers yeah. and explaining to them why we made the changes that we did and, and what changes we made. And so far, I mean, that extra effort, it's, it's, that's a hearts and minds one step at a time. And it's not an easy effort. But when you explain to them why we did what we did, and, um, are what we did, they tend to get back on board with us. So uh, we're, we're retaining as many as we can yep. while growing a new base of more useful consumers. Always a pleasure, sir. Thank you. Great Chris to see Beersgard, you. Chris the marketing director of Vancouver Island Brewing. There's more BC Brew on tap coming up. Host Hair Services for Joe Leary and BC Brew on Tap, provided by Bailey Murphy of Avant Garde Hair Studio in Yaletown at 1075 Mainland Street. For a list of services, call 604 688 1986 or online avantgardehair.com. Location services for BC Brew on Tap, provided by Mahoney and Sons at Canada Place. For a list of locations, visit mahoneyandsons.com.
Welcome back to BC Brew on Tap. We're at the newly reopened Railway Club in downtown Vancouver. Trevor Cayley's is the bar and beverage director of the Donnelly Group. Good to see you as always, sir. Good to see you, Joe. Now, it's what a cool room. I mean, you've kind of kept the authenticity of this place, the, the, the origins of this place, and just kind of kind of put a fresh coat of paint on, if you will. Yeah, this was a really, uh, really fun renovation for us. Uh, we took it over early 2017 and, uh, and did a, just some minor stuff, kept the, the framework, the base, the bones, all the same, like we're leaning on this bar top here and this has been here the whole time. The stage is in still, still in full effect, the games room in the back room is still there, so yeah, it's, it was a lot of fun to build. So Trevor, when you're taking over a place with the heritage of the Railway Club, what thought process went into what do we serve on tap and more importantly, what, what don't we serve? Well, the Railway Club was, as it was formerly known, uh, was the, one of the first places I ever came to for a craft beer. So we really wanted to keep that scope of like, this is the place to go for beer. So we really did stay away from most of the mainstream stuff that we serve in some of our other locations and we find around the city. So we're going anywhere from you know big, bold, American espresso stouts coming out of Oregon from you know the BC sours that we're starting to see creep on the market full time now, we're really all over the place. You and I go back some years and some beers. Um, let's. I'm trying to think back to when I first met you. It was probably you know prior to 2010. 2010, I think, was kind of that 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 initial boom of uh, like, almost like the gold rush, if you will, of, of of craft beer. But when you first got into the industry, what was what was, the, what was the beer scene like, other than the big guys? What was it like? Yeah, I mean, my first drinking days were, you know, getting a case of Heineken was really splurging. And uh, outside of that, it was anything from, you know, anything Labatt, Alexander Keats, uh, Sleeman was huge, Okanagan Springs. You know, it was, those guys are still around, but it's definitely a different kind of consumer that's looking for those beers. Um, and it's amazing how much the beer palette has grown up over the last seven, eight years. So go back to when you you got involved in selecting beers for the various locations. Obviously, there's a lot to choose from. Okay, what is what is the thought process? I mean, obviously, it's about you know what's going to move, what's going to sell, but at the same time, you know, you want to be able to have a nice, wide variety. How important is what you decide versus what the consumer asks for? Well, the consumer is always the most important, right? We always want to have something that somebody's like everybody's got to have something that they can drink. And so if they they ask for one brand and we don't have it. There's got to be something that's at least close enough or we're introducing them to something that could be their new favorite. I mean, that's the ultimate goal, is to really teach the guests something while they're in trying to enjoy their, you know, spending their beer money, their hard-earned beer money most of the time. Did you ever in your earliest days, uh, in, the, in the capacity of bar and beverage director for the Donnelly Group, did you envision we'd be where we currently are in 2017? Beer in, was in terms of the like beer availability. Yes, I. I mean, we saw it coming back in 2009, 2010. I mean, the first really obscure beer, and I'm not even saying it's obscure, but like the most obscure beer that I ever saw was the the Brooklyn. Um, it was the Pennant Ale coming yeah. out of Brooklyn Brewing in New York, right. and I remember putting that one on tap at Gramble Room, and it was just like no one had ever heard in Vancouver, British Columbia. There, no one had heard of Brooklyn. You know, six months later, we've got Garrett Oliver coming to Gramble Room to do a beer dinner. And then from there, it was just like, well, what else is out there? You know, it was a big wake-up call. So uh, where does it go? I, I know it's a loaded question. I, I have to think that the initial, the, the boom is, is kind of trickling down. Like, you're still going to see more springing up, but nowhere near with the flurry of activity we've seen in the last five years. Are you talking about the bubble? I'm talking about the bubble. The mysterious bubble that yes. just won't seem to pop? Yes. Yeah, I is don't, it going to pop? I don't, I don't think so. I think what, exactly like you just described it, I feel there's going to be a bit of a, not quite a lull, but I think we've plateaued for a little bit, and now there's going to be the odd brewery kind of poking their head out and, and starting up like on smaller production. But I, I don't think in terms of creativity, these guys are even close to being done. I think we're going to see a lot more beer trends just kind of circle around from the guys who are doing a really good job. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the really big global brands and companies are starting to sniff around Vancouver to maybe pick up, you know, you know, do the Elysian thing or the Ballast Point thing and get bought up by somebody a little bit bigger. In terms of the passion, I don't think a lot of the brewers in Vancouver are ready for that. But uh, I, I think the sky's the limit when it comes to the beer market in Vancouver. Okay, Trevor, I've got one last question for you, and it's kind of a loaded question, okay? I'm not into the sour party. I'm, I'm, you know, I'll take a sip here and there, but it's just not my thing. What do you think the next new thing in beer might be? Is it going to be like super sweet beers or 
Uh, sky's the limit. What, what do you think in your professional opinion? Well, I'm pretty sure we're not supposed to like sours. I think they're the classically the, the the style of beer and that flavor profile. Are, I don't think our mouths are supposed to like we're that. We're not built that. We're not built that way. Right. So it was. It's it's really cool that people are like. I see guys that sit down at the bar and they're like, I know I'm supposed to like sours now, so I'm going to order a sour, which I think is great when people actually sit down and they try to figure it out, because that's essentially how like the big bold massive IBU IPAs got popular, right? It was basically four or five brewers just having like a bit of a contest to try to make the bigger yeah. IPA and then the, the consumer just basically had to love it or leave it at that point. In terms of the future trends, I know that the, you know, the super unfiltered hazy IPAs with a lot of ar aromatics but not a lot of IBUs are super popular right now so I have a feeling we're going to see a pretty strong summer there. But I really think that now that all these brewers have figured out their brewing systems and they're getting, you know, better and at their core recipes, that we're going to see a lot of classic styles come back in the next year and a half. You're going to see a lot of guys just focusing on, you know, that core pale ale, that pilsner that they're all starting to play around with now, like the craft pilsners, craft lagers of the world, because that's what people are able to drink a lot of. And I mean, and brewing, it is a business. So you're going to see a lot of guys making a business play out of these beers, but they're going to be extremely well crafted, extremely flavorful, and, de and delicious. Well, this guy would know, so let's mark those words. Trevor Cayley's, thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. The bar and beverage director of the Donnelly Group. There's more BC Brew on tap coming up. That's a wrap for BC Brew on Tap. We always encourage you to enjoy all that British Columbia has to offer, but please remember to plan a safe ride home and drink responsibly. We'll see you next time. Clothing for Joe Leary and BC Brew on Tap supplied by Red Dragon Apparel. RedDragonApparel.com. Brew on Tap, this is Mike Schaefer.